Hello, hello, hello. This is chapter six on thermochemistry, the very last chapter of the entire semester of your um, shallow Christian chemistry career. And so let's get into it. So we've talked a lot about chemical reactions. We know that um, that matter is conserved and atoms get rearranged, but we haven't talked a whole lot about, well, how much energy gets released or taken up in a particular reaction. Because, uh, you know, if you light something like hydrogen gas, it's going to give off a whole lot of energy. Uh, but then we could also talk about just something as simple as, you know, water in the freezer turning into an ice cube. And there, there's thermochemical processes in play there. So how is that working? So that, that's what we're going to talk about. This is going to be two parts. So today's part one, and tomorrow, um, tomorrow or Monday, I'll probably post it tomorrow, um, will be the second half of this chapter. And then the homework and quizzes will be Tuesday, and then we'll be reviewing for the final tests, then tests, then finals, and before you know it, you'll be, you'll be a high school graduate. So to, to kick this off, there are a lot of different types of energy that you're already aware of. Um, now, could be kinetic energy, the energy of movement, magnetic, electrical, electrostatic, acoustic, that's sound energy, gravitational, mechanical, and, and, and so radiant. Your book talks, <coughs> talks about radiant energy, which is essentially electromagnetic, uh, and there's, there's others. Um, but what all energy has in common is the ability, the capacity to do work or produce heat. So again, when we see the word heat, it, it either gives it thermal energy or removes thermal energy. And work, which you should remember from physics, is when you move matter. So when you move any type of matter from here to there, if you move anything with mass, if you accelerate it, then that takes energy and we call that work. Now, the first law of thermodynamics is pretty simple. All the energy we have in our universe is conserved. It can be converted, but you're not going to create more of it. You're not going to destroy any of it. So something as simple as a fire. Here we have a nice Bunsen burner. We have methane that's getting burned and turning into CO2 and water. So we know mass is conserved. The number of atoms are conserved, but we could talk about the amount of chemical energy stored initially, and then how much thermal and electromagnetic energy are given off. So the light that's given off is electromagnetic energy, and the heat that we would say it generated is thermal energy, and then there's chemical energy lost, and so it's it's just a give and take. Uh, you should watch this video on why don't perpetual motion machines ever work. Uh, now, I'm not going to talk about every one of these types of energy, but I'm going to hit a few of them. So from physics, you learn about mechanical energy. So if I taught physics, I would, as a project, have us build a trebuchet. It's a type of catapult. You see them in like old war movies um, where you have a large massive collection of something in this bucket and you crank this down and when you bring the mass um, as you raise the mass up, you're creating potential energy. Then when you allow it to sling, it converts to kinetic. So kinetic is the energy of motion, potential is the energy of position. But typically when we talk mechanical energy, we're thinking of macroscopic. So large, big stuff moving around. Now, in contrast, thermal energy, when, when you think of thermal energy, it's really the same thing. It's the sum of kinetic energy, just like what we set up here, but it's associated with small random motion of um, atoms and molecules. So if something's cold, it has less thermal energy. If something is warm, it has more thermal energy. But overall, they're really the same thing, whether we're looking at large collections of atoms moving together or whether it's just causing individual particles to vibrate or move around more. So both of these are highly related. It's just, it's technically just a matter of uh, what we're referring to, whether it's a big object or a chemical object. So thermal energy is thinking more of the movement of particles 
Um, we have electromagnetic, which again, in your book, it calls it radiant as in like it radiates from the sun radiation. Um, we've talked about this before. All of chapter seven covered this in a lot of detail. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there. So moving on. What we do care about in this chapter is chemical energy. Now, chemical energy is sort of like potential energy. So if you lift up something up high and you say you store up potential energy here, chemical energy is stored within the bonds. Um, and what we mean by that is when bonds break to form new bonds, there's going to be a net difference in energy and it could either give off energy or take in energy, but it's the breaking. So every, anytime a chemical reaction happens as bonds are broken and new bonds are formed, it's going to either take or release certain amounts of energy and not all chemical energy is the same. Again, we have whether we're talking about covalent bonds or breaking ionic or intramolecular, there's, there's a whole lot of variation there. But again, we'll, we'll look at this one in a lot more detail. Now, similar to this, at least because it's at the atomic level, we have nuclear energy. So we've already covered a whole chapter on this. This is where we see energy. Energy is conserved, but mass is not. Uh, and we use the, the energy to mass equivalence, E equals MC squared. And so this is when we actually have the nucleus changing its identity. There is a mass defect where there's a mass energy conversion. But besides mentioning this again, we're again, we're going to spend most of our time up here looking at chemical. So what we're interested in is when chemical reactions result in thermochemical changes, which is the heat change that can happen in a chemical process. Now, when we use the word heat um, in this chapter, we want to make sure we're using it appropriately. Now, the inappropriate use is to, to use it as a ver as a noun, like you possess, if you pick up something that's hot, you might say it has a whole lot of heat, but that's technically not true. Heat is the transfer of thermal energy. So heat is a verb. So if you touch something hot and you burn yourself, there is a heat transfer and the heat transfer is from the skillet to your hand. But if you touch something cold, if you pick up an ice cube, there is also heat. Now you don't think of ice having heat, but there's thermal energy coming from your hand to the ice cube. That's why it feels cold. And so we would call that heat. So anytime there's two, um, two substances at different temperatures, there's going to be heat when they interact. Now this is, it's not in the notes, but technically the zeroth law of thermochemistry um, summarizes this. It says that if you have um, two, I can't remember how it's worded. If you have two systems in equilibrium with a, another system, then all systems are going to be in a, a temperature equilibrium, meaning they'll all eventually reach the same temperature. So thermal energy transfers from higher to lower temperatures. So it's evening out the thermal energy. Again, when we measure, when we talk about temperature, it's a relative measurement of thermal energy. So we've already said that gases at higher temperature, they're moving faster. So they have greater thermal energy. Now they are not equal, but again, there's a correlation. So higher temperature, higher thermal energy. Oh, and you should watch this video about, hey, there's no such thing as cold. And it's it talks more about, again, when, when you think about, it's like, like you've probably heard, like, is there such a thing as darkness? Well, there's it's really just the absence of light. In the same way, it, when we talk about cold, cold is not a thing. It's the absence of heat or the absence of thermal energy. In this chapter, we're going to be referencing a system. And that's because normally we have a nice beaker or flask and all of the matter stays in there. Um, and that's all we care about. But we're interested in energy that can be released um, or it um, released or taken in. And because we want to know how much thermal energy is present or is not changes, then we have to make sure we know what our system is. So our system is what we care about.
and the surroundings is every other part of the universe that could exchange either mass or energy. So throughout this semester, we've usually dealt with an open system where both mass and energy could be exchanged. Um, now, normally, normally the mass was not changed because we would, you know, we would try to keep it. We would have a lid or maybe we we weighed the difference of what of vapors that did leave um we could also have a closed system where again it's we close it off so no matter can be exchanged in this chapter we'll talk about some isolated systems and what we do by that is we don't want anything to exchange we want to make sure all the energy that was present in this system stays in that system um, and so when we get to calorimetry, which will be in the next video, we'll, we'll talk about isolated systems. Now, here's two words you probably already know, but we can generalize every reaction as being either exothermic or endothermic, where exo means to exit um, and thermic as in thermal energy. This is any process that gives off thermal energy to the surroundings. And what's notable about them is they feel hot to the touch. So when you think of fire, like the combustion of hydrogen, it's hot. Now, the reason it's hot is it's giving away energy. So here are those reactants, hydrogen, and oxygen, and they are, upon bonding, they are going to the lower energy state. Again, we talked in the last, the last chapter 9, 10, when things bond, it's because they go to a lower energy state. Well, how do they do that? they give the energy away to the surroundings. So here we have hydrogen and oxygen making water, releasing energy, but in a similar note, or actually dissimilar, when, when you put water in the freezer and it turns to ice, you don't think of that as hot, but it has to release energy. So a refrigerator, a freezer, what they're really doing is pumping out thermal energy to the outside. They can't just eliminate that energy, but if you ever went to the back um, usually bottom of a refrigerator or freezer, it's going to be hot because that thermal energy has to go somewhere. And so it's pumping it out of, out of that rectangular prism. Now, other processes have to be then endothermic, where they take in energy. Now, if you hold on to an ice cube, it's going to feel cold. And that's because you're imparting energy. And so water was going from a solid to a liquid. As you go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, it takes in energy. Um, that is an endothermic process. If you've ever used an instant ice pack, it's a two, a two compartment uh, thing that has ammonium nitrate in one and water in the other. And what you do is you squeeze it to break the internal barrier and shake it up. And all it's doing is dissolving ammonium nitrate in water. And the dissolution, so as it dissolves, it has to take in energy. So it's taking it up to a higher energy state, and it, it, that is, makes it an endothermic process. So since it has to take it from the surroundings, it feels cold to the touch. Um, now, it, thermo, thermochemistry falls into a larger category called thermodynamics, and it looks at all the different ways heat and work and energy can be interconverted. And one reoccurring theme in thermodynamics is state functions. And this refers to different properties like energy that they technically don't matter. Their, their values do not matter on the pathway in the process. Um, it doesn't, in this case with energy, if you were to look at the potential energy gain from these two hikers, one took a direct straight up the mountain uh, path, the other took the scenic route. If we were to look at their change in, in potential energy, they're exactly the same. Um, all that matters is where they start and where they ended. The path is completely non-relevant here. So this is what's known as a state function. In the same way, we can then talk about the internal energy of our system. So U represents internal energy. So the change in the internal energy is the final minus initial. So we don't care about all the stuff that happened in between. All we care about is the initial state and the final state. 
Um, and then if we want to rewrite the first law of thermodynamics, we said any change in the, our system and energy has to be equal to the negative magnitude of our surroundings. So if our system gained 52 kilojoules, it's because our surroundings lost 52 kilojoules. And, and internal energy, en energy is not the only state function. Some others to know, pressure, volume, temperature. So you need to know these, these four because some things will be state functions and others will not. Um, now, here's another way we can write the first law of thermodynamics. So the, the internal change in energy of our system is equal to Q plus W. Now, the, the definition of energy was something that had the capacity to do work or produce heat. And that's exactly what Q and W represent. So Q is heat exchange. So whether it's making something hotter or colder, that's Q. W is work. So our system can do work or it can be worked on. And so collectively, Q plus W add up to the internal energy change. Now, I, I remember first learning this and thinking that this equation was weird because most chemical equations always seem to be products, like the ideal gas law is P times V equals N times R times T, and um, various other ones like the formulas for osmotic pressure and boiling point elevation. They're, they're all, there's typically multiplication and division, but this is just one thing plus another. And it, 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 it makes sense to think about if you remember like what heat is. So heat is the movement of particles. So that's thermal energy and work is typically we say the movement, the macroscopic movement of large things. So whether we're talking about moving tiny atoms you know, their random motion or the collective movement of bulk materials, you're still just, they, they're they still both looking at the motion of matter. And so when you look at just, when you collectively add the motion of matter, that is, that is energy. So all we have to do is add them together to figure out the net energy transfer. And so one of the, one of the, um, Probably complicated things that are confusing things will be at first is knowing the signs. So it's important to be able to understand whether the sign for a particular process is positive or negative. So there's this nice table. Um, I, I think heat absorption is probably the easier one. So if we're going to say that something is absorbing energy, think of it like your bank account. You know, um, you're, if something is endothermic and it's taking in energy, then you're going to see on your bank account a positive sign. But if it's releasing energy and it's losing <laughs> thermal energy, uh, you know, it's, it's like a deduction, um, then there's going to be a negative. So heat that gets absorbed by the surroundings will have a negative sign because it's lowering the energy from that system, but absorbed will be positive. Work is a little bit harder to comprehend, but let, let's look at it. We'll look at it here. So in this picture down here, this, this, this is what we mean by work. So fundamentally, if you have a chemical reaction that's doing work, then it's going to essentially be associated with the increase in a gaseous volume, like you're seeing here or a decrease in a gaseous volume, like just imagine going in the reverse. Um, solids to liquid, liquid to solid, um, there's not a whole lot of work being done there. And so it's really only substantial if you have the expansion or compression of gases when a chemical reaction is doing mechanical work. Now from physics, you learn that work is force times distance. So you apply a certain force for a certain distance, that's your work. But what we want to do is look at, well, how can we relate this to delta V? So the, how can we look at the change in volume? And so we're, we're going to say that work is equal to 
um, instead of just force times distance, pressure times delta V. So when this gas expands to some delta V, again, that delta is change, as, as it expands that volume, it's what it's doing is pushing against this applied force or in this measured pressure. And so the product of this pressure pushing down times how much it expands is equal to the work being done. Now we can show this that these two are equivalent if we consider what pressure and volume are. Volume is just three dimensional distance. So instead of volume, we could say meters or time, meters times meters times meters, or that's distance cubed. Pressure is force, pressure is equal to force divided by area. Or instead of saying force over area, that's force divided by distance squared. So if we have pressure is force over distance squared times distance cubed, that works still out to be force times distance. So we're gonna be all, for, all, for these problems, we're always going to have a pressure and we're gonna be interested in, is the volume gonna go up or down and how much? Now, to, to actually get a, a, a unit of energy, like a joule, or a calorie, this is an equivalence you'll need to know. You won't have to memorize it, like it'll be given on quizzes and tests, but you need to know to like come back and reference it. So for every liter pushing against an atmosphere of pressure, that takes 101 joules worth of energy. So if it's two liters pushing against one atmosphere, that's 202 joules of energy. Or if it's one liter, pushing against, if it's expanding one liter against two atmospheres, that's also 202 joules of energy. Now, this also shows us that if we look, if you were to throw a, a balloon out uh, into the middle of space where there's no pressure, then even though the balloon would expand, there would not be any associated work being done. So if the pressure is zero, the work is zero. Kind of like if, if, if you say you did a whole bunch of bench press today and you say, well, how much did you bench? And you say, oh, I just moved my hands. I didn't actually use a bar bell with any weights on it. You wouldn't really say you were doing work if you weren't moving anything. Now, work we're going to say is equal to the negative pressure times delta V. Now, we're throwing this negative in there because anytime you do work, your energy levels go down. So again, if, if you're working really hard on chemistry, by the time you're done, you're exhausted. And so we need this, this negative sign in there to reflect that. So the amount of energy you're doing make, make the, in terms of work, throw a negative on there to show that that's how much your overall energy is dropping. So let's look at a problem. So we have, we have two liters of gas expanding into six liters under two conditions what is the work being done so in the first one it says it's expanding against a vacuum which means there's no gases around it and so as we've already said then if the pressure is zero it doesn't matter if what the delta v is there's no work being done but for b we're expanding against 1.2 atmospheres so negative 1.2 times four liters, so it's always final minus initial, gives us negative 4.8 liter atmospheres. And if we then want to put that in terms of energy, which we do, we're going to use this equivalence that every liter atmosphere takes 101 joules. So that's 490 joules of energy used. And so that's our system will have gone down negative 490 joules. So it has a negative sign. Now on this problem, we're seeing that the volume is decreasing. Um, it tells us that the gas is compressed and it tells us the amount of work being done is 462 joules. It also says associated with this is a heat transfer of 128 joules from the gas to the surroundings. What is the overall energy change? Now, this question can be tricky because if we already go ahead and say that internal energy is just the sum of these two, you might be tempted to just add these together and say you're done. Uh, 
Now, the, the real question is, what is the sign of these two? Is this positive 462 or negative 462? Is this positive 128 or negative 128? So we have to ask about the conditions of, of the, the process. A gas is compressed. So it is applying pressure. It's compressing it to a smaller volume. So you could think of this almost like a mouse trap or a spring that you press into that tense energetic state. And it takes energy to compress air. So anytime you you do your system is getting compressed and taking up a lower volume, it is getting worked on. And if it's being worked on, it's putting energy into it. So instead of this being a negative, this is positive 462 joules. Now for the heat transfer, it says it's the heat is going to the surroundings. So if it is losing it, then it's negative 128. So positive 462, so it's being worked upon, and it is exothermic, so negative 128. And once you know the signs, then it is as simple as just adding it together. So the net gain, it tells us there's a net gain of energy. Um, it's going to a higher energy state um, upon, uh, upon this compression. But again, they kind of offset each other. Now, something else I want you to know with this, again, the whole, with the whole um, is it doing work or not, is that if a chemical reaction produces gases, then it's doing work. If it consumes gases, then it's, it's not doing or it's being worked on. And so here are three different classes. The spacing got weird in Google Slides. Um, either way, uh, on the top we have two molecules of ammonia make four moles of pr gaseous products. Here we have um, TNT making nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon. And what they both have in common is there's an increase in moles of gas, positive two, positive 20. Now, because they're both increasing the moles of gas from reactants to products, we can say work is being performed by the system and the sign of the work is going to be negative. So again, they're, they're doing work. Now, the next two, we have the combustion of ethane and we have sulfur, a sulfur oxide and water combining. Both of these end up reducing and having a negative delta N of gases. And so by reducing the number of moles of gas, they are being worked on. They're going to end up taking up less space than when they started. They're getting compressed, and we're going to say they have a positive work. And then the final two have values of delta Ns of zero. So the first one, no gases are included in all. And the second one, it goes from two moles of HF to one mole of H2, one mole of F. And so if still delta N is zero, there will be no work or very, very close to very um, to zero work. Enthalpy is a word we're going to use that stands for heat. It's a special kind of heat, it, but it's the way we're going to quantify the quantification of heat as a state function. Now, First thing to mention that technically work and heat are not state functions. What I mean by that is there is, you know, to be a state function, you should just be measuring the initial and the final uh, value uh, before and after the process. And the delta would always be the same. But that's not true for heat and work. They're both pathway dependent. So. There, there is no such thing as an initial work. So if you looked at a, um, I don't know, a weight that was just sitting still, there is no value of work you could assign to it. Meanwhile, imagine that weight moved and then you measured a, well, unknown value. You can't subtract an initial and final to get the amount of work. So work is something that changes um, across the, during the process. The same is true for heat. There, you cannot measure a initial heat 
and a final heat. Um, again, you could look at the same process being carried out where internal energy delta U is the same, but you can do it certain ways where there's little heat and a lot be of work being done or a lot of heat and only a little work being done. If you want a reaction to get going where you want a lot of the energy to be released as heat, like if you're using thermite, you want a large Q and a small W. But if you want more of an explosion, if you want a lot of work being done, instead of tanner or instead of thermite, you might use tannerite, which has a very similar similar chemical pathway, but there's very little heat, but a whole lot of work being done, even if this, the delta U's are the same. There's a great video that helps illustrate this from Crash Course. You should click this link. You don't have to watch the whole thing, but it illustrates it very well with a car traveling down a hill to bump into a banana stand. Um, so you, you should watch that. Now, fortunately for us, most reactions occur under constant pressure, meaning if you don't, if it's not in an isolated system where the pressure can go up or down, um, or it can, uh, if it's not isolated, then the pressure is pretty much consistent. So then what we can do is rewrite instead of work in, instead of heat and work we can replace work with delta p uh, or p delta v so work is pressure times the change in volume well we already know that pressure and volume are uh, they are both state functions and thermal energy is a state function so if we can write heat in terms of three other state functions, we can treat it as well, and we're going to call it enthalpy, which is delta H. So both Q and delta H refer to thermal energy change, but delta H has to be under constant pressure. So again, there's what we're not able to do is um, where's the pen? That's not it. No. Oh. No, I don't remember what the shortcut was I was looking for. But what we're not able to do is measure any sort of heat of the products or heat of the reactants. So this, this, each of these individually is kind of like a question mark. But what we can find is what is the change in enthalpy. It's, it's, I think of this as like if you were to somehow wake up in a hundred story building, um, that's kind of a weird scenario. Um, and you're in a stairwell, but none of the the none of the, the floors are labeled. You have no idea what floor you're on, but you do know if you were to start running up the stairs, maybe you know you went up plus five levels, and you would say your delta level is plus five, or maybe you went down then three, and your delta level would be minus three. So collectively, your delta level would be plus two. Now. Hi, Fancy. At no point, that's my dog, uh, at no point would you know necessarily how much, um, what level you were on at the beginning or end, but at the very least, you would know what is the difference between the two. And so that's how we're treating this enthalpy. So if we look at the exothermic combustion of, I want to pull up, the exothermic combustion of methane, we can see a value of negative 890 kilojoules per mole. So a negative enth enthalpy is exothermic. Whereas when water, or sorry, when ice freezes, nope, that's melts to a liquid, it has a positive value. It's absorbing six kilojoules of energy per mole. Um, so when, when we start looking at different chemical reactions, Anytime there's a bond being broken, which is required for all chemicals, um, that component is endothermic. It takes energy to break bonds, but then when they come together, when the, when the reactants, the atoms come together to form new bonds, bond formation is exothermic. And so collectively, whether a reaction is exo or endothermic, you have to look at all the bonds breaking and forming uh, to see if the overall delta H will be positive or negative. Uh, we can see this visualized in a reaction energy diagram where we have reactants at the beginning, AB, 
forming products CD. So here's the overall potential energy of the reactants on the left um, and then the products on the right. And what it's showing uh, in both cases, here we're looking at from where we start to where we end, it has a lower potential energy. Again, that's chemical energy. And because it lowers, this is a negative delta H. So it is exothermic. Um, and so if there's more energy given off from the bonds forming than the ones that were required to break the initial bonds, it'll be exothermic. But here, this is endothermic. It's ending up at a higher energy state. And this happens if it takes more energy to break the initial bonds than the ones that got released. And so you're seeing this initial jump up in, in both cases, there's this input of energy and then the release. So you're, you're always seeing that the amount of energy needing to break the initial bonds of the current substance first, and then the second, the products, as those things are being made, you have that release and that's where it's coming down. So we can quantitate that, but and that, that's called the activation energy. And if you ever take college chemistry too, you'll talk more about how this determines the rate of a reaction, or at least you'll quantitate it. But the bigger the activation energy, the slower the reaction will happen. Um, it's also the reason why you could fill the room with methane and it already has oxygen. And we know methane and oxygen burn. But without, loud, without a spark, you're not going to get a big kaboom. So this is the amount of energy needed to break the first bond so that the reaction then can then continue. Um, now, one way we can, besides the spark, one way we can make a reaction go faster is we add a catalyst. So in biology, these are called enzymes. But what they do is they lower the, reaction, the required activation energy. So it's, it's almost like a coupon. Instead of having paying $20 for something, you had a 10% off, hurrah, now it's only $18. So catalysts, they're not, they're not actually part of the reaction. They're just kind of like a helper. They don't get consumed, um, but they lower the reaction, reactivation energy. Probably the most famous example is for the fixing of nitrogen into ammonia, which is essential to fertilizers. Um, nitrogen has a very, very stable bond. We'll talk in a, in a few minutes about its high bond enthalpy. So we need it biologically, but our bodies can't break it down uh, in this N2 form. So you breathe in 80% nitrogen, but then you just breathe it right back out. So the Haber process is a famous um, reaction where it uses catalysts like iron aluminum oxide that serve as a solid support and lower the activation energy so that these things can more easily break apart and then reform. Um, and this, this reaction was brought to you by Fritz Haber. Um, and this is known as the Haber Bosch, which I don't have anything about Bosch, another chemist Bosch, but it's a landmark chemical reaction that changed um, history because without it, um, the world's you know, in the 1920s and 30s, they speculated there was only enough agriculture to be able to produce food for up to like 3 billion people. And you probably know we're almost at eight. And so it was you, this was one of the first ways we could produce synthetic fertilizers, um, because before then we were just waiting on like using cow manure and stuff. And there's just um, there's only so much cow poop out there. So you know, we're happy for that. Oh, also, he was a war criminal. Um, in World War One, he was a German chemist, and he was responsible for the creation and overseeing of uh, many, many, many uh, of the first types of chemical warfare. Uh, he's, he's a pretty bad dude. He won a Nobel Prize um, for this reaction. Okay, bond enthalpy. I mentioned this just a moment ago, but bond enthalpy is a way we can, you know, one way we can calculate the overall enthalpy of a reaction and it looks at the individual stability of every single bond that has to get broken and every single bond that then gets formed and so here are some diatomic bonds h2 cl2 hcl and 
here the bond enthalpy tells you how much energy would you have to put in to completely break that bond and separate those into two con you know distinct overcome the stability of the octet rule and all of that jazz so we have 436 kilojoules 247 and we can see that this value goes down now we we actually talked about this back in chapter nine uh, and we said it's because as you go from hydrogen to chlorine chlorine is a bigger atom and the bigger the atom the longer the bond length the weaker the bond so since hydrogen is smaller it has a shorter bond and a stronger bond and so that means we would expect hcl to be between them which they are and then uh, here's oxygen oxygen has it's bigger than hydrogen but it has a double bond so going from single to double that increases and then nitrogen has a very very strong triple bond so as the bond order goes up it's more and more stable oh and then i guess here's where i was going to include that um, so we see bond enthalpies go up from single to double to triple now for polyatomic molecules we have to look we have to use average values so the ones in red are the ones that you can directly measure because there's only one way to have hbr and nn and oo but something like hn um, depending on what the other things that are bonded to the nitrogen could slightly change this bond enthalpy and that's true for all these ones in black so these are average bond enthalpies um, based on all the different ways you might find them and so for water if we were to say well what's the bond enthalpy for hydrogen and oxygen there's what when you take off the first hydrogen 500 kilojoules is required but to take off the second it's only 427 so again these are not the same but the average of them is 464, which is what you're seeing in this table over here. So this can be used to predict the heat of the overall heat or enthalpy of reaction. So think of all of the reactants. We, we go to this table and we add up all the bond enthalpies of every single of every single bond that has to get broken. And then we think about them getting and so here we're seeing let's see reactants going to the atoms so that is energy that has to go in but then we look at them being formed and so as products are being formed these are the same values are negative we think of them as being that much energy being released and so collectively we look at the total energy that has to be put in minus the total energy that gets released and if you're not familiar with this symbol that's sigma and it's the sum so the sum of all the bond enthalpies of the reactants minus the sum of all the bond enthalpies of products and so if more energy is required to break bonds then it'll be endothermic if more energy gets released then it will be exothermic and so let's try that with water so what's, we're going to estimate the enthalpy change. So most of this is just looking stuff up in tables. So if you go and look up hydrogen, it has a bond enthalpy of 436. However, there is two of them because of that coefficient. So the total energy to break up 2H2 into four atoms is 870 kilojoules. There's one O2 bond, and we look up the value to be about 500 and so when you add these together this is the collective energy change needing to break every single bond here then we do the same thing for water um, so we have there are four oxygen hydrogen bonds so there's again an h2o each water has two and then there's two of them so four times 460 is 1840 so going back up to this top equation it requires 1371 to break all the bonds it gives off 1840 and collectively we have this negative four, 470. so that negative is telling you if we would expect it to be exothermic which again if you've ever seen hydrogen burn it, it's it's fiery so it is exothermic
as we would expect it. So a thermochemical equation is a chemical equation that also shows us the enthalpy change. So it looks like this. So here's chemical, and then it says the enthalpy change when this reaction happens is 890 kilojoules per mole. This is, I feel like I talked about this already, um, methane bubbles that get built up and you release them and then light them on fire and it just looks fun. And then you should watch this link. So a couple of things to know about these. First, the coefficients are super important. So if it says it's negative 24 kilojoules, then that number refers to the coefficient that it matches with. So in this case, since there's a one for N2O4, it's negative 24 kilojoules for each one mole of N2O4 produced. But if we talk about this in terms of NO2, it's negative 24 kilojoules per two moles of NO2. So whatever, however many of kilojoules, it's per whatever the coefficient it is. If we reverse the reaction, you simply reverse the sign. It's like we said, if if you go up five flights of stairs, it should make sense that you have to go down five flights of stairs to go in the to get to the opposite side. So if this is negative 24 kilojoules, rewriting it, now it's 24 positive kilojoules. If you scale, so if you multiply the coefficients, water is normally six kilojoules per mole, but if we multiply by both sides, we get two, and then it scales up to 12 kilojoules. And it is really important in this chapter to note the state, what type of phase, because a solid melting to a liquid for water is six kilojoules, but a liquid going to a gas to vaporize is 44 kilojoules, so not the same. So let's tr practice that. So we have sulfur dioxide burning with oxygen to make sulfur trioxide, and it tells us it is exothermic. But what is the heat evolved when 87.9 grams is, of SO2 is converted? So we start just like half the problems we've done in this class. We convert to moles. So I'm really hoping at this point you could find the molar mass and then convert from grams to moles. So we divide by it. Then we're going to use this value. So we're trying to get from moles to kilojoules. And so we have 198 kilojoules per mole, but what you need to go and look at is the coefficient is two, so it's negative 198 kilojoules per two moles of SO2. So multiply, divide, and we get negative 136 kilojoules. Um, now here's one I would have you work, but you're not here, so I'm just gonna work through it. Um, so it works the same way, but it says normally, sodium reacts with magnesium chloride to make table salt magnesium and this is a exothermic reaction negative 180 but if we want to make elemental sodium then we could take table salt and elemental magnesium and reverse it through what's called electrolysis that means we're going to put more energy in to make it go the non-spontaneous way which is from right to left and we want to know um, how much energy would it take to convert 150 grams of NaCl back to an elemental sodium? So if we want to change the direction of this reaction, what we need to know is how does it affect this delta H? And we said it's just going to change the sign. So if this reaction releases 180 kilojoules, reversing it, it has to absorb 180 kilojoules. And at this point, it's converting 150 grams to moles. And then once again, we have to look and see, well, the coefficient is two, so it's 180 kilojoules per two moles, and we get 230, so that is positive, so it needs to be endothermic. And here's another problem that I would normally have you work out in class and then reveal the answer, so if you want that validation, Go ahead and hit pause and try working this out to see how many grams of ethylene it would take to get 450 kilojoules. Um, and then I'm gonna go through it right now. So we're given the thermochemical equation. We're gonna say that to release it, it needs to be negative 450 kilojoules. And 
we're told that it's negative 1411 kilojoules per mole. And since the coefficient for ethylene is one, then it's just per one. And then we just need to go to grams. So use the molar mass. So the molar mass of ethylene is 28 grams and we get 8.95 grams when we multiply through. So the last thing I want to show today is looking at how we can compare enthalpy to the overall free energy or uh, internal energy change. Because internal energy isn't just enthalpy, it's also work. So what if we want to look at the amount of work and enthalpy that go into the energy change? Let's look at this example. We have sodium in water. Um, this is a... Uh, redox single displacement reaction it is exothermic it releases a lot of hydrogen gas so if by releasing a gas we know that it has work that work is being done um, and it does get hot and so it is exothermic so we want to know how if you if you don't just look at the enthalpy if you also look at the work being done what is the overall decrease in and in the internal energy so Again, here we're seeing we have the amount, a normal amount of air, of water vapor, but once the gas is produced, it expands and work is being done. So going back to this equation, we have the internal energy is equal to heat, enthalpy, plus work, which is negative P delta V. So I'm going to just skip some of the math and say that for one mole of hydrogen being consumed or produced at um, 24 and a half liters at one atmosphere using our conversion factor, collectively, it works out to be about two and a half kilojoules worth of work. Now, we're already told that it releases 368 kilojoules of enthalpy. So if you add these two together, it goes from negative 367 down to negative 370. So what I want you to notice here is that while the amount of work did contribute, it's not that the overall internal energy change is not that much different from the enthalpy. And th this is going to be something that's really common that most often the amount of work being done is insignificant to compared to the heat flow and so if you know if you know that the enthalpy or is very strongly exothermic it's highly expected the internal energy for a reaction would also be negative and they and it's doubtful that the amount of work would offset it um, let's look at another example that will show the exact same thing so here's carbon monoxide reacting with oxygen to get CO2, exothermic. Now, can we have this equation again? We're given delta H is negative 566. And by looking at this reaction, we're, we can see there is three moles of gas going down to two moles of gas. That means this, this system is going to be worked on because the volume would decrease. Now, we can show that with this P delta V, but in the last chapter, we had an equation for the ideal gas law, and it was PV equals NRT. And so if we're looking at how many moles of gas change, we can substitute NRT to say, well, delta N is negative one. It's going down by one mole of gas. So our system is being worked on. And so when we plug in all the appropriate constants and temperatures, we convert to joules from kilojoules. Uh, temperatures in Kelvin, then we see that instead of negative 566, it's negative 563, which again, the amount of work is very, very insignificant compared to the heat. So five, negative 566 to only about three kilojoules of work being done. Okay, with that, I'm going to leave you. Um, this is the, the last practice problem. And so instead of going through it right now, I'm going to leave it to you to try to do it. And I will start the next video going over it. So have a good